I'm the executive director, so I'm a person who is running the organization by law, but I'm also responsible for the fundraising and administration, finance, that side of operations, sort of providing the, the money for the, for the organization to function. I would say fair, professional, of course, and uh, based on, on facts. I'm running the Center for Investigative Reporting. So we are a media agency that is dedicated to provide fair and unbiased information to the citizens of Bosnia and Herzegovina and the region because some of the topics that we cover are also regional. By doing that, we are trying to, of course, provide as factual information to the citizen as possible based on the documents without any intervention. So any opinions, any, any additional diversions from the, from the fact. And by doing so, we are hoping that we are raising the level of understanding of the situation in the country or in the region, but also educating the people who are re our readers on which information are true, how to find those information, who to trust, and why to trust that particular source of information that they are, they are deciding. By doing that, we are countering this information. So basically, just by teaching the audience that information are available through trusted sources, they are basically fighting this information just by doing the search. Fact checking is a new term in, in, the, in the sort of a global media phenomenon, but basically every serious news organization is doing fact checking within the, the office. In our case, basically that's the last level of verification of this before the story is published, where the independent person who, would, who did not participate in the investigation on the story is actually uh, checking that all facts stated in the story that is finalized, basically went through the editorial process and, and it's ready to be published. Now the fact checker is, is checking whether all the statements are based on the documents and that they are not misinterpreted, which is basically the, the main thing. So fact checking in the context of media reporting is an inclusive part of the process of developing stories or the video or any, any other media product, but basically uh, it's inclusive of the media reporting process. We, we do have investigative stories that are available bilingually, so in local language, Bosnian, Croatian, it's pretty similar, Serbian, that is available on our, on our page because we function basically as a media agency. We publish the stories primarily through the media partner organizations in the country or in the region that are taking over the stories for publishing. Eventually, the stories are deposited on our web page where they are permanently archived and they are available uh, both in local language and in English. All stories are supported by the uh, multimedia content being short or longer videos, uh, animations, infographics, the photos of course, and, and all other material depending on the story. Not every story is the same and cannot be illustrated the same, so we are trying to, to come up with as many possible uh, additional documents just to provide an easier understanding of the story for the wider audience. We are also publishing on different uh, social media, so we are trying to adapt the content to different media, social media platforms, which are then dictating different approach. Additionally, we do not have our own training program because we are investigative reporters, but we do provide lecturing for the trainings that are done by other organizations. But we do have some of the educational material that is published on our webpage. So basically our webpage is the, the collection of all of our materials that are provided for the years. This is our 16th year of existence. Plus, we're also trying to summarize the, the achievements of a year in a annual report, which is also published on the web, to provide an easier access for the audience to something that is, that is a highlight of a previous year. So either by numbers, when we are trying to basically address certain results of, of our stories or most successful stories or stories that have actually uh, made a change in the society because that is an ultimate goal of journalism in, in, in general. Additionally, we are working a lot because our investigation is based on, uh, on documents. The amount of documents that we are, official information that we are collecting with every research is massive. So we are trying to put that into additional use by uh, providing access to databases. So a lot of our research, a lot of our, our investigations ended up in a database on that particular topic, which we are basically trying to, to assist the, the officials in, in terms of sort of providing an easier access, a digital access to the documents that they have in our hands, because that's a big thing in, in, in Bosnia these days. But we're also trying to provide an easier access for other fellow journalists, the researchers, anybody basically, to continue research. Because again, data journalism is a, is a relatively new thing in the Balkans, but it is not a, a new thing in the rest of the of Europe or in the world. So that is basically, we are trying to provoke 
others to look in the documents and, and try to find a different angle, different story, additional story, uh, provide access for additional research and stuff. So different components that are actually adding up to the same goal. I think that the biggest challenge overall is that we have to really fight hard to, to go back to the basis of journalism. Journalists will have to go back to respecting professional standards. They did not change. They might have been adapted to the new situation in context of adapting to, to new platforms that are obviously appearing and will continue to appear. Journalists these days are fighting with social networks, with citizen journalism, which is a concept that is hopefully going to die soon because it's not journalism, we should not be calling it that way. But the fact that uh, journalists are so often criticized for not being professional, for, for, for being biased, for being politically affiliated with different political options is, is definitely diminishing the position of journalists themselves and basically exposing them to being called liars, to being called political hands and any derogative name that, that are. So the challenge is to go back to the basics, to go back to professional standards and to adapt to the new, new time. There will always be a need for journalists. It's a continuing need for unbiased information, truthful information. That everything else that is affecting that connection between audience and journalists basically is something that we all have to fight for and that is the, the remaining challenge. Challenges also are financial, are professional, are educational, are, I mean, you name it, but that is, that is basically not different from any other profession. We just have to continuously learn and continuously uh, adapt to, 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 to the challenges of the society. Number one, journalists will have to start cooperating with fellow journalists from the rest of the world. There are great solutions in the world and it has never been easier to access those solutions because of the internet and because the world is becoming very global. So communication and cooperation among journalists, uh, just continuing communication in particular, sharing the information, sharing knowledge, sharing solutions. How did you come up with certain story? What did you do to investigate this or that? That is definitely on the side of journalists. On the side of, of general public, we as, as citizens of this world will have to find a way to engage more in selecting the sources of our information. I do that for a living, that's simply the way I have to do. But everybody, we have to spend time every day to educate our neighbors and our friends and everybody else just to, to let them know. People are, are taken by their, their job to do something else and they, don't, they just want to read the information, don't want to search for the information. But they have to learn and, and adapt to the, to the fact that not all the sources are actually truthful sources. That's definitely the way to, to, to fight. We are here for for four days to talk about fighting disinformation and hate speech and in particular because that is becoming a threat to the societies. But we will not be able to cancel the platforms that are the spreader of the hate news or disinformation. We will have to just find a way to counter it by providing the content that is based on the information. I think that's the only way. We cannot forbid. Every time when you forbid something, that is becoming actually more interesting for everybody. So I think we'll just have to find a way to, to provide truthful information on any false information that is out there. COVID-19, COVID-19, COVID-19. I think the starting of the epidemic, it's not the date that we can talk about as the sort of the start of the disinformation. It only brought up all the evil sides of disinformation and, and how it can actually make confusion and, and fear and how we can juggle with all the all the bad sides of the pandemic. So I think that the, this year will particularly be interesting for the researchers to come basically to, just to see how, how the same groups. It, it's interesting to me that with every new thing that, uh, that countries in the, in the Western Balkans or else in the world are trying to implement in, in the context of the contemporary world is actually fought by on the same basis as that's not a traditional norm. COVID is not traditionally here so we do not believe in COVID and we do not obey to the, to the rules. Pride is not a traditional thing so we don't want LGBTIQ people protesting around us. Uh, global warming is not a traditional thing so we do not accept the global. It's always the same 
same thing, the traditional life and traditional norms. Traditional life has changed, new world is here to stay, so I think we will all have to accept that certain traditional norms are also adaptable, including fight against COVID. Eventually, we will get to the point where we have a vaccine that will be available for the general population, which I think it's going to mark the history definitely by the anti-vaxxer movement. So that will definitely be the date in time to come, hopefully soon enough. The anti-vaxxer movement is going to uh, grow up again. So they will be very loud and, and very present. I think that another sort of milestone in the future is going to be the time when we can officially declare the pandemic is over. So when we have to go back to learning how to live normally as we did before the pandemic. And I think that, that the next sort of step is definitely related to accepting that human rights are to be respected with no questions asked. When will that date come and whether we will be able to mark the day or the period in time when, okay, everybody were accepting that human rights are equal for everybody. That's another question, but I think that should be marked as a holiday in some future calendars, hopefully in 2020, if not 2021. Again, COVID, of course, it, it actually marked the information altogether. So everything is about COVID or around COVID. But I think we also are seeing that the rise of populist movements around the world. We're also seeing a, a rise of a nationalistic, if not fascistic, uh, movement around Europe in particular, but also the rest of the world. I'm just afraid that we are going to see uh, the new world order because of the pandemic. I mean, this is a crisis of, of historic size and it will probably provoke, if it didn't already, certain changes in the order of the, of the world. So I think that that type of information that, that they're actually following the new, so new power around the world is, is obviously already uh, strengthening. Maybe it's not still obvious. The Russian propaganda, of course, is, is a new evil, a known evil, but I think that just because everybody are focusing on Russian propaganda, we are letting other propaganda of all others, not to name them here, I think that we are just letting it go simply because we are too much focusing on one source of this information, which I'm very much convinced that it would actually be better if we would focus more not just by declaring uh, Russian sources of information as false or fake or what the, uh, this information, but basically trying to learn to read and see the truth from their side and then be able to sort of bring the bridge over this this uh, long-standing uh, conflict now in, in information. So that is a challenge for the world to start thinking how to get over it. There is a, a rise of fact-checking portals that are not journalistic, but basically they are actually functioning as a, as a typical fact-checking organization. So they are basically taking the, the story, the information that is available, and checking it against facts and providing sources for the facts that are there. I think that that is a good tool, in addition to all other tools, that is a good tool for education of the public. So general audience uh, would have to uh, start accepting and regularly visiting those sites because they are popping up on a regular basis here in Croatia it's a factograph we heard about the factograph yesterday a couple of times but there are several organizations across the, the, the Western Balkan and wider basically because that is a good way to learn how to recognize what to look for in an information basically just to have this this understanding that not everything that we read being media or, or a social network is not necessarily true or it could have an angle. So just by learning what to look in a story is a first step in, in fighting disinformation as a global. Otherwise, we will, not, we will never be able to win this uh, battle just by expecting that only one group, one side of the society is responsible for making the world better. That's a lost game already. I'm a personal favor of the anti-vaxxer movement. I'm a very solid believer that, yes, the choice is definitely a, a human right issue. So yes, we all have a right to choose, but if people choose 
not to vaccinate themselves or their kids, then they should not be allowed to enjoy all the other aspects of the civilized society, of the modern society. So yeah, you do not want to vaccine. It's individual choice to be part of the anti-vaccine movement, but then no transportation, no internet, no uh, schools, no educational institutions, no jobs in the public administration, no life enjoyed within the rest of the community should not be allowed for those people. Just by basically uh, saving the rest of the world who choose to, to accept the results of a, of a modern world and the modern medicine is should be kept for those that are supporting vaccines and, and basically fighting all the diseases that the world has success, successfully overcome. So I think that that would be my, my absolute number one. It's hard to put a finger on one. I think that public figures in general should be very responsible toward the public. No matter what they do, no matter what profession they choose to, to be at, I think that they ought to be responsible toward the public. Because once you raise above the general public and become uh, somebody of recognition, then the role of that person is to contribute to understanding of everything, including media literacy. Anything else would be very responsible and should not be in behavior of a public figure. Now, we all know that that is not happening, but unfortunately, again, that's that's a part of the of the general code of conduct, I would say, and understanding of the, of the roles and responsibilities. I think we all have to go back to our personal understanding of roles and responsibilities this where yes we do have certain rights a set of rights these are free countries so those rights are very extensive but at the same time once you have a right you also have a responsibility to respect that right but also to behave in accordance with that right so no absolute freedom freedom is very relative in the context of respecting the freedom of somebody sitting next to you no matter whether you like or not that person or that custom or that city or whatever it is it, it would be very hard to, to name just one but I think we have to be very careful again in, in selecting the, the role models particularly in the younger generations COVID has actually prevented us all from traveling and meeting other people. Those norms that are set now by COVID, where we are keeping social distance, when we are very much afraid to engage with other people, to talk, the, the understanding of COVID and how it spreads is still very much vague. So we are trying to keep low profile and very distant from other people. I think that that will leave an enormous uh, mark on all of us. Eventually the COVID will be over, but then unfortunately these social norms that are now set by COVID will be hard to fight against and that will be uh, a challenge for the, for the world to overcome because we are social human beings. We have to interact with people, we have to exchange with other people, we have to learn from other people and give our knowledge to other people and I think that is uh, something that we will all together will have to work hard on overstepping the, the, the boundaries that are set because of the, of the pandemic and will have to remain until the pandemic is uh, successfully fought, fought against. But uh, I think we have to have this understanding in our heads that this behavior, these norms are only temporary and we will have to go back to our regular trusting people, liking other people, liking interactions with people, communication with people, exchanging information, a learning from other people and all other aspects of a modern citizen of the world.